really this whole process of that life and death. You know, whenever we face that, we have our own sadness, but we, perhaps, sadness or even joy of release and freedom for our loved ones. But aren't we always also reminded of our own mortality? In those moments, aren't we also thinking about, wow, what am I, what am I doing with my life? <laughs> How much more time do I have? You know, what's it all about? And that's really what this Holy Week is all about. It's that kind of presence. It's that kind of energy that says, wow, you know, one thing we probably most of us will experience is a time when we give up this physical life, when we leave this beautiful earth, at least for a while, and move to another dimension. And so what is it that we want to do with that short walk that we have on this earth? And what kinds of things do we need to complete? All those questions come up, don't they, when we think about or consider what it's all about and how much time we have, which we don't always know. <laughs> Sometimes we do know, though, that, that there is an end coming sooner rather than later. Jesus knew that for sure, and we're going to talk a little bit about that story. You know, country singer Tim McGraw, you know, had a friend who told him, I, I, wasn't, I, I knew I wasn't going to live long. And, and Tim says, wow, what did you do with that information? What did you, how did you live with that? If we were living like we were dying, we might live a little differently, right? Everything gets ramped up a little bit, doesn't it? When we recognize that life is precious and sometimes short. And that's really what this Palm Sunday is ushering in. That's what this Holy Week is all about. So the beginning of Holy Week, we have Jesus coming in to Jerusalem, the spiritual center, just like we are riding in toward the spiritual center every day that we are conscious of our path. And why does he come in on a donkey? Everybody's, you know, waving palms, and it's a great time of celebration, and they're saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of Lord or, or Spirit. And, and they're putting their garments on the ground for the donkey to walk. But why a donkey, you know? It seems like the king is coming, you know. He should be in some kind of chariot, right? <laughs> but he comes in on a donkey because he's coming in humility. He's coming entrusted with, with what spirit has given him, this precious life. And so it's a cue for us, isn't it? I mean, the, the events that happened 2,000 plus years ago in the historical and mythological and doesn't really matter which facts are true, does it, in the spiritual walk. It's the potency, it's the import of the story that we take in. And so, and it's, and it's then for our lives, right? So it's about us. So if we were living like we were dying, there would be an element for most of us in a conscious way of that kind of humility of, wow, what I have been entrusted with, this life, this sometimes shorter life than we want it to be, right? But even in an average lifespan, it's a pretty much a blip on the, if you look at the evolution of time. And so what is it that I'm all about? And so Jesus comes in, they're hailing him as a king, but he's teaching a different way of king or queenship, if you will. He's teaching a different way of leadership, a different way of service. He's washed his disciples' feet. He's telling everybody that, that service is about service too. Leadership is about service too, not being served, not being hailed. And, and, and raising up the ego. It's about the spirit and the humility of the spirit. And so it's a great teaching, this humility that he shows. And it reminds me of when a friend of mine, Kathy, was making, in a process of making her transition. And she talked about the, the utmost sensuality of the simplest things that she was so present to. She said, when I take a shower, it's like this ecstatic experience. She said, I can feel the water like massaging my head and I'm thinking this might be the last time I take a shower. And the warm water just all over her skin. And she said she just felt so alive and she looked so radiant. But you know, we don't have to wait till the time when we're making our transition to bring that kind of full presence. 
If we live like we were dying, every time we washed our hands or our face or took a shower or a bath, we could be in that kind of ecstatic experience. We wouldn't be thinking about what's next, right? We'd be thinking about what's right now, what's in this moment. And it brings us to that place, maybe even to our knees, of the kind of awesomeness that this life is, this great gift that it is when we slow down into that kind of presence. And it brings with it just naturally the gratitude and the humility that I'm talking about. We can always find something to be in that kind of holy space. Some of you might know Jack Kornfield. Anybody know Jack Kornfield? Not necessarily personally, but you might know his work. Well, you might know him personally. He's just down the road here. You know, he founded or co-founded Spirit Rock, and um, he has many books out. But when he was uh, quite young, he went over to Thailand, and he was the only Westerner living in this monastery and moving toward becoming an ordained monk. And so he was trying to learn the rules and he, he, you know, he was, he was older than some of the 20 somethings, but you know, so somewhere in there, young to me, I guess it's always relative, right? (laughs) And so he said that he would, you know, he would bow to the teachers because he knew that was something you were supposed to do, but he didn't realize he was also supposed to be bowing to all of his elders. And so he asked, because he wanted to do it right, one of the other monks, well, who are the elders? And they said, well, anybody who's been ordained before you is an elder. And he looked around and he thought, wow, I got to bow to everyone. I got to bow to that 21-year-old kid who's here just because the food is better than at home? (laughs) He's like, and I got to bow to that farmer who's on the farmer's retirement plan, you know, who's, who's never meditated a day in his life and all he does is chew beetle nuts? But he wanted to do it right, and so he began to bow. And you know what he did? He found something to bow to in every person. He said, I began to bow to the wrinkles on the old farmer's face and to the hands that had labored in the fields. And I began to bow to the young men because their lives were so full of opportunity and possibility. And so I bowed to those things. And he said, pretty soon, I loved bowing. He said, I would bow before I went into my forest hut. And I would bow when I came to the temple. And I would bow to, if it moved, he said, I bowed. (laughs) (laughs) But what a great opportunity that is for us. I don't know if you want to bow necessarily, but you may. But, But just taking that idea in that everything is holy. It brings us to that alive present moment that we're always meant to be in. And so many of us are, you know, I'll speak for myself, often I'll find my mind planning into the future. Or maybe some of you tend more toward looking to the past. But to be really present, like my friend was in the shower, you know, to bring that kind of presence is a choice we can make at any time. And it brings us that sense of humility. So if we look at the next event during this Holy Week, Jesus then goes into this mode where he curses the fig tree and he goes in the temple and he throws the the, the tables over. Seems like an odd thing, right? In the last week of his life, this is what he wants to leave as his legacy? This angry outburst? And yet, what was that about? When I think about him knowing that he was coming to the end of his life and he had this short time to teach what he came to teach. And it's like, they don't get it. Ah, oh, you know, he's got only so much time and they've turned the house of prayer, this sacred sanctuary into what he calls a den of, de- uh, a den of thieves. And there's livestock everywhere and there's excrement and there's shouting and there's negotiating and there's probably some cheating going on. And this is not what he pictures for his, his father's house. And it's not what he pictures for the legacy that he leaves behind. This is his life's work. This is his service. This is why he came. This is his purpose and his passion. And they don't get it. How much time? I don't have enough time. Time's up, he's feeling. So you can imagine that, right, for yourself. Whatever it is that is a part of your soul's purpose, your service, your passion, what have you come here to do? Do it now. (laughs) And the message, if anything, in this whole message today is why wait? 
or don't wait. <laughs> don't wait. Don't wait till it's too late. Do what it is that, you're, that brings you joy and fire and passion and excitement and a sense of, wow, this is why I'm here. <laughs> And you know those, it may be small moments. It doesn't have to be like a really big, you know, huge life shift, although it may be for you. But it also may just be about opening up, you know, opening up what is, opening up your own gifts, opening up your own life and looking and seeing, how is, how is it that I'm being guided more deeply and more expansively in this moment as if this was my last week to live? If this truly was, try that on, if this truly was my last week to live, what would I do? What would I really want to make sure? What would be my message, as Gandhi said? Remember when the reporter yelled, there was a story about a reporter yelled to him as he was boarding a train. They said to Gandhi, what is your message? You know, they want those fine last little words that they could put in their story. And he said, my life is my message. <laughs> and so it is for you, and you, and you, and you, and me. <laughs> our life is our message. So what kind of life are you living? You know, if, it's, if there's places where it's like it needs to be cleaned up or habits that need to be dropped that aren't working for you or ways that you need to step up or step in or be courageous, do it. Don't wait. That's the message of Jesus' passion. That's the message of what he's trying to show us. Don't wait till it's so frustrating. <laughs> and I'm not saying that he waited. I'm just saying he had a short time. He only had three years for his ministry. That's a pretty short time. And so after the, these events, the, the events that sort of demonstrate for us a sense of humility and the and this, uh, this sense of passion in the money changers, then there's the Last Supper. There's this, probably a Passover meal, a Jewish Passover meal, and Jesus has his disciples, his closest followers, all gathered around him. And he makes it into this beautiful, intimate ritual. And in this beautiful, intimate ritual, he says, this is my body and my blood. I mean, it sounds kind of, you know, it, if you, it's kind of a little macabre, right? If you just hear it on the surface. But it's not on the surface that we're talking about. He's talking about the, the substance, the essence of spirit, the truth of who we are. The, it, take in the essence of, not just me, but the, he's symbolizing the divine, the Christ spirit. He's saying, Take in the divine. Bring forth the divine and the life blood. And allow that to animate your being. So there's this beautiful ritual that a communion, you know. It's that time in our lives when if we were living like we were dying, we might want to create some nice rituals with those that we love the most. But more than that, we, or even so, even deeper than that, we want to make sure that we say, I love you, right, to the people we love. And that we say, I'm sorry for the things that ha didn't work out the way that we wanted them to. Or it, where we forgive the people that we need to forgive, like in Tim McGraw's friend in, in the song that says, I, I forgave the ones I'd been denying the forgiveness. So what is, you know, take an inventory <laughs> of your own heart and say, you know, what needs to be forgiven, including myself? What needs to be let go? What needs to be loosed so that I can fully live? the joy that I've come to live in this world. So that's the invitation of the communion. It's the connection with those that we love the most, that we care about the most. And that can be the whole world, certainly sending blessings to the whole world. But when it comes down to that essence, we want to really be and speak and say and do what it is that we need to speak and say and do. Speak and say. Hmm. <laughs> Really wanted to hit that one, apparently. <laughs> so that's the communion piece. And then, and then after the Last Supper, there's the, the Garden of Gethsemane. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, there is this, this experience where Jesus and his disciples are coming, are, are together. And Jesus goes away to pray on his own. And he asks the disciples to hold space for him. I mean, this is their spiritual teacher. Right? And he's, he's about to move on to the next dimension. He's about to break through a whole new level of human consciousness. But the, the disciples can't fully take this in, you know, what's about to happen. And so it says three times Jesus went away to pray, and he prayed, take this cup from me. 
I love it when spiritual teachers are so human, you know? Then they become really accessible, right? So take this cup from me, please, you know? I don't want to die. I don't want to suffer. It's not enough time. I got more I want to say and more I want to experience. And, it's, and the earthly life becomes so precious, you know, when we're, we're present like that. And we can choose to be that present any time or every time, every moment. I get to look out on this beautiful lawn and see a child dancing. And <laughs> the plants are waving in the sunshine and there's that sense of, in your faces, there's that sense of, God, it's so precious. Don't waste it. Don't give up. You know, whatever it is that we're called into, do it, be it, allow it. So in the garden, you know, he comes back after one time praying and he wakes up the disciples because they've all fallen asleep. He says, hey guys, you know, could you, could you pray? <laughs> it's a pretty important time. Could you, you know, this is like a pivotal time in human consciousness. He doesn't say that, but he's really trying to get them, you know, wake up, hold space with me. This is really important. And it's like, and it says in the Bible, their eyes were heavy. <laughs> It's like they couldn't, you ever get in that kind of heavy sleep, like you just can't, you're trying to wake up, but you just can't? And that's the kind of space they're in. So, so what's happening metaphysically, when each time he comes back, even a third time they're still sleeping, is that that part of us, that ego goes to sleep, right? When we're, when we're on the edge of that kind of consciousness sometimes, there's a part of us that wants to pull away. There's a part of us that wants to, to be in the comfort of, of the ego space and doesn't want to step in to the fullness of what might come in the, in the richness of consciousness. And so that, that pull, that push-pull piece of us, that part of us that will cause us to go to sleep. And so this is another lesson that is illuminated for us is wake up <laughs> and stay awake, stay awake. Stay awake. So if you even need to just tell your mind that when something is rich and powerful and you, and you know, like when you, you, you say to yourself, okay, I'm going to live like I'm dying and so I'm going to stay awake. And when I notice that my ego wants to drag me down into the old habits that don't serve me or the old ways of talking, anybody still doing their complaint-free bracelet? Today would be 21 days if you've done it for 21 days. Anybody done, done it for 21 days? No? Yeah, yeah, I know, I'm on day three, so, you know. But, you know, you, who knew? I don't know. So, so anyway, for th those of you who are participating, or even those of you who aren't, you're doing great work, so turn to your neighbor and give him a high five. So this, this is a, a Larry Schelling joke. You know Denise, the interim minister who was here before us? He says that's how you celebrate Palm Sunday. <laughs> I know, it's kind of a groaner, but thought I'd pass it on anyway. <laughs> right on cue. <laughs> so where were we? I've, I've derailed myself. <laughs> so, so here we are in the Garden of Gethsemane, right? And, and there's this, this surrendering that happens. So Jesus prays that prayer and the disciples are falling asleep, and so then he gives over, full surrender. And he says, if this is thy, you know, thy will be done. If this is thy will, let it be done. And that's when we step in. That's when we step through. That's when we, we come to that veil of consciousness that is ready for a new beginning, a new sense of understanding, a new sense and way of being. And it's a scary place to be because, yes, things might change in the old life. But I guarantee they'll change for the better. Maybe not immediately. You know, back at, at Easter time in 2002, I, um, I went on a silent retreat and I, and I told myself, I want to get inside this Easter experience. I had a lot of these like, you know, bring it on kinds of prayers when I was in ministerial school. And then I sort of learned later, but. <laughs> and be gentle. <laughs> So I went on this silent retreat and I, and I wanted to just really understand because I could really feel the, the, the potency of Easter. 
what it was all about. I could feel it on this just cellular level, but I hadn't really fully experienced it, you know? So, so I, I went on the silent retreat and I read the, all four gospels of the different viewpoints of what happened at Easter time. And I did a lot of prayer and meditation. And then I it just sort of in that state of gui being guided, really, I got out some pens and markers and paper and I, and I drew a cross. And, on each, and, and in unity, the cross is crossing out. It's, it's crossing out that which no longer serves us. That's what the crucifixion is all about. So crossing out the aspects of ego that aren't serving us. The part of us is falling asleep, for example. And so on each end of the cross, I put something that I was crucifying, so to speak. I was crossing out of my own way of being. And I flipped it over and made a kite on the other side. And that was to be symbolic of the rising Christ. You know, on each end of the kite, I put something in that, that Christed nature that was rising up, that I was becoming, that I was coming into, or, or unveiling, I guess you could say. Now, that was a time in my life when I was really excited. I mean, so that was Easter time, and then in June, I was going to be ordained, and I was getting married. And I was having the first same-sex union on the campus of Unity, which we had petitioned for, so everybody knew about it. I mean, we had met with the board, and we had... You know, so this was a big thing. It was like a, a big breakthrough. And then the whole thing, my whole life after this Easter retreat, completely fell apart. So we went ahead and got married because I felt guided to do that, which was still a part of the crucifixion process. <laughs> <laughs> Hate to say it. <laughs> and four months later, it dissolved. And my classmates were going off into their ministries and I was like what the heck is my ministry supposed to be you know I was just in a space of like shock and you know I was like in the tomb right after or after the crucifixion it's like suddenly got dark and the stone has been rolled over and it's like whoa what happened I was just in the bright light of day I was on top of the world and I knew where I was headed and I knew what it was about and I was excited and it's like the whole whew. so a little cautionary, bring it on prayers, gentle. <laughs> but I tell you, I'm so thankful because it wasn't, I got the Easter experience that I wanted. And not just because of that, but it opened up my whole life because what follows the crucifixion? The resurrection, amen, right? So then we come out into the light and in time we get to see the blessings and the beauty and the power of the choices that seem like they were made for us in a way when we get on the ride, when we get on the donkey and ride to the spiritual center, we don't really know what's going to happen, right? But that's what we're being invited into. And so I can stand here to tell you, having gone through that crucifixion and resurrection, do it. <laughs> even though things might get a little shaky for a while and they might, it might surprise you how life changes, it's the way of spirit. And sometimes it happens in big and powerful ways and sometimes it happens in small ways. Although usually I reserve the crucifixion word for the big ones. <laughs> and you may have had your own, many of us have. So whatever that is, remember again what that experience was like for you to have moved through a really difficult time in your life. And, and look now at the bright light of day, the new consciousness that was born that you carry with you now. So that's what this week is all about. It's a big week, right? It's not just some old historical thing that the traditional churches call Holy Week. They call it Holy Week for a reason. <laughs> because it's opening us and inviting us into the most powerful experience of our lives and the yes to spirit, the yes to riding to the spiritual center, the yes to the humility and the gratitude and the passion and the communion with those we love, and yes, the surrender. Doesn't have to be to your physical body now. You're here, you're living, you're breathing, <laughs> but in every moment, that, that present moment, to die again and to be reborn in every moment. It's a constant invitation that spirit gives you, and I hope you will say, Yes to that invitation. Yes? yes. Whoa, yeah. <laughs> God bless you. I dreamed of rain and the rain's king and peace spread over the land. I dreamed of rain and the rain's king. Peace.